Hey, it's me, Steve. It's December 13th, 2017 as I record this. And today what I'm going to do is I'm going to take you on a tour of the evolution of the Mid-Continental Rift, or MCR. Um, it's the uh, one billion year old rift system in North America that underlies Lake Superior and extends past it where the continent tried to split apart. And I just think this is really interesting. In 2015, there was a uh, awesome research letter paper. This is still being researched, done on uh, large igneous provinces, and that's going to be cited in the end. I'm actually going to show you some slides from it. It's free online, um, where we're kind of getting a better understanding of the tectonics involved in this thing. And this one I'm going to do here is I'm going to take you through my interpretation of what they have there in a little. I'm going to add something that they left out. But what you're looking at here is from the 2005 geologic map of North America. And that red line, A to B, prime, or A to B that is where the cross-section is going to be at. Um, a will be on the left, B will be on the right. It's about 500 kilometer distance. It's not an exact cross-section. It's a, it's a stylized, generalized cross-section to show you the general evolution of the rift. But... Um, in order to uh, get a picture of about where it is, this is where the uh, the uh, cross section is located. Okay, so what you see here is the first cross section. Um, as you can see at the top, this is pre-rifting stage. This is a general geology along that. Uh, 500 kilometer uh, transit and in the previous slide I showed you the cross section was A to B here I have A to A prime I screwed up my bad I'm sorry A prime would be the B um, but as you can see here uh, the horizontal scales about 70 kilometers the verticals about 20 kilometers which means we have about a three time vertical exaggeration here I wanted to keep the vertical exaggeration to a minimum because I wanted to show you some stuff and what a lot of people leave out in the representations of the Mid-Continental Rift and, and how it formed was the rock that it intruded into and this rift began to form. This is a failed rift. The continent tried to split here and stopped. It failed. We think it's due was due to the Grenville orogeny, a collision of basically the ancient Appalachians into the Laurentia continent. Um, at least that's the most workable theory as of now. But as you can see here on the upper right, we have different age rocks. Um, some of them go f are one age to the next. I basically took the sedimentary rocks, the uh, what you see here is Paleoproterozoic and Mesoproterozoic. Uh, those X's and Y's, the, the ones that are mostly sedimentary or metasedimentary have these wavy lines on them. They're the greens and the blues. That's to show you general bedding. It's not accurate to 100%. It's just to show the general trend of beds. And those rocks are mostly uh, sedimentary. Is where your WX and your VW and the purple X in the upper right um, are more igneous metamorphic provinces. And as you can see here on the right side of the cross section, you see the continental crust, the thickness of it. The Moho discontinuity, which is represented as the line between the lithosphere and the, the lithospheric mantle and the continental crust. So, what um, these faults here, you see pre rift faults, and I put little hatches on them. And the reason why I did that is because when the mid continental rift starts forming, you're going to see creation of new faults. And I wanted to show how those faults um, propagate and how they kind of the existing structure kind of influence where this rift would be see even though the mid-continental rift was a failed rift the rocks here labeled x uh, and wv here on the left side of what says pre-mcr suture that is where the continent did successfully rift uh two and a half billion years ago so one and a half billion years earlier so it would be a logical place and then this wx came and accreted to uh, laurentia later but th that would be a logical place it's a weak zone where new rifting could easily happen and i think that's what actually did happen that old suture served as the uh space for the new uh rifting that was going to take place very soon after this slide here okay so this this next slide here that we're looking at right now is 
at about 1.15 billion years ago. That's what GA is. It means billions of years. This is where you get the initial extension. And as you can see here, you can see a magma chamber began to form under the continental crust. And this caused extension. You can follow the X's and the Y's and see from the previous slide and see how the, cr the continental crust itself is thinning, but it has to go somewhere. It can't just thin. So it's moving horizontally out of the way to make room for this. And what you see on these, some of these solid line faults, which are rift faults, you'll see these half arrows. That's showing you the relative movement of these faults to one another as the magma rises up and follows that uh, old continental suture there. All right, now we are at 1.12 billion years ago. This is the first stage of volcanics here. We still have extension and even further thinning of the crust. And what you're starting to see here is Y31. That's late Mesoproterozoic. That's the oldest MCR volcanics. And you're going to see this again. It's at the top. You're going to see me add things. And then the things in parentheses are the time frame the, uh, those deposits and everything's going to be in billions of years so you can see extension continues you start to see a magma chamber with at the base of the actual volcanics themselves these the entire mcr volcanics are basically just flood basalts and andesites some rhyolites spilling out onto the surface they're and they're unusually thick even for rift uh environments but that's because of something that happened later which i'll get into here in a few slides all right so some time goes on now we're at 1.09 billion years ago the second and final stage of volcanics all right now here is when we start to see things like uh, the portage lake volcanics is what we call them or plvs the y31 are the older ones they don't really outcrop at the surface very much but the portage lakes the y32s do and they, um, this is the rocks that hold the uh, uh, ancient volcano that forms Porcupine Mountain State Park in the Upper Peninsula. And here you see the magma chamber has reached its height. It's come up decently into the continental crust and it's still feeding. Now during this whole time too, you're getting this magma chamber is feeding dikes off to the north, south, east, and west. I did not put those on here because they're not visible at that scale. I'm just showing you the main body of the mid-continental rift that was forming. And you can see how wide this basin is getting. It's getting to the point where the rift is almost successful. The ocean is almost going to come through. But it doesn't. It stops. And we're going to go into what happens when that stops. And like I said before, it's probably because of the Grenville uh, orogeny to the east that this ceased. And so, well, what happened when, when, when it stopped? Well, here we are at 1.05 billion years ago. This is the first sediment fill stage. This is when you no longer have an active magma chamber. Okay, it's shrunken greatly in size. You do still have some volcanics. If you look at Y33, that is all sediments of the Oronto group, which would be your Copper Harbor Formation, which is overlain by your Nunsuch shale which is overlain by your frida sandstone and you'll see that i there are some volcanics in the base of the Arano group within the copper harbor because even though rifting had officially stopped that magma chamber was occasionally still venting lava units onto the surface until the completion of the deposition of the Arano group the frida also has an intrusion in it called the Bear Lake Stock that was dated at 1.06 billion years ago. But it, at this scale, it doesn't show up, so I didn't add it. I originally was going to, but didn't. And here you should have the age of the lake shore traps, those lava flows that occurred within the Oronto group. And now sediments dominate over volcanics. As where Y32, volcanics dominated over some sediments. You did have some interflow conglomerates in Y32, but at this point, they are done. They're gone. So you start, the basin starts to subside, and as you can see, the continental crust is being pulled down as that magma chamber empties. And what I have here in the bottom near the magma chamber, I have something called the core. I'm going to talk about that in more detail at the end of these slides. But for now, I'll just, that, that's the last of the magma chamber that has solidified in this scenario. Um, to just, that's enough for now. And as you can see here, the old faults that started to form when um, the rift was beginning, you still have that normal fault movement. 
um, present here as the subsidence uh, begins to take over now that that magma chamber is empty. But something is about to change very soon here. Okay, here we are at 0 0.85 billion years ago or 850 million years ago. Now, this is when the environment changed. Now you can see we're still getting basin fill. We're still getting that Z, which would be the Jacobsville group and its equivalents. Um, so sedimentation at this point has essentially stopped and reversing of the existing faults begins. Why? Well, because we still have subsidence going, but it has decelerated as the continental crust is thickened to a stable configuration. But something else is happening that stops that subsidence. The main thing that stops that subsidence was that Glenville orogeny I told you about. So now we start to get compression. All right, our rift is getting compressed, and it's getting also compressed not only from the east from the Grenville orogeny at this point, but also from the south. So a lot of those, which you see here, the half arrows to the right, a lot of what was normal faults begin to reverse. They are no longer normal faults. They are becoming thrust faults or high-angled reverse faults. Off to the left here, I don't have arrows on that one because it's kind of in a stagnant position before it start, that one too starts getting reversed. And here you have the core, and now the magma chamber is gone. We have no more magmatic activity. So once the Grenville orogeny is complete and this compression ceases, well, what happens? We basically get a modern appearance of the basin. Um, what I have here, the only difference really is the fact that um, between... This, I still have a compression here, um, which may have actually ceased only 280 million years ago uh, in the area of what's labeled here called the Keweenaw Fault. Uh, that was originally reversed during the deposition of the Jacobsville, the previous slide I just showed you, but it may have actually persisted that long. They're still doing work on that. Um, a old professor of mine is studying it to see exactly how long that fault was uh, reactivated for in a reverse direction but during but between that previous slide and today what we also had too is we had some paleozoic sediments come in and i have pz question mark here in the middle of the basin above z because there may or may not be paleozoic sediments there under the glacial stuff we don't really know the general thickness of what here is labeled z or the jacobsville group suggests there might be some but no one's ever drilled down there so we don't know but it is present on the south side or the a prime side here where you see pz um, off to the right and as you can see the paleozoic sediments even though everybody studies those and we haven't divided cambrian ordovician silurian devonian carboniferous um, permian and you know they contain lots of fossils and the evolutional life they are so thin compared to the rock thickness of the mid-continental rift and the reason part of the reason why these rocks are so thick is because of that compression and as you can see here they're about 20 to 30 kilometers in thickness here and as you can see some of the due to the compression some of the faults have been offset where i have labeled again the core which i'm going to talk about here in a minute as soon as i'm done with this slide you can see its configuration has changed i just kind of filled it in between the faults just because um, it's really complex and we don't really know and the core is probably the same density as um, the overlying volcanic so it's not really going to show up too good on any uh, profiling um, unless someone decides to drill down that deep but about five kilometers or so uh, above the moho discontinuity it's kind of a big question mark as what's exactly going on there because that whole area is the base of the continental crust is highly deformed and faulted so it's really uh, conjecture that part the basal part of the continental crust okay so this next slide here, before I start talking about the core, this is where I took my model from that you just saw. When I get done with this and talking about the core, I'm going to show you those seven slides of the evolution of the Mid-Continental Rift again, just really quickly um, before the references. By the way, here's North America's Mid-Continental Rift. When the rift met LIP, LIP is large igneous provinces. And here I picked this figure one. I pulled the abstract so you can read it. But I also picked uh, figure 1A because this is a gravity uh, map that shows the outline of the mid-continental rift. 
And what you see is you see the biggest part at the top occupies the Lake Superior Basin, but extends down all the way almost to Texas through Oklahoma on the, on the west side and on the east side almost to Alabama through Mississippi. So this rift was huge um, in its day. So here's just A, B, C, and D cross sections showing you basically what I just showed you, but they're showing you the actual data that they achieved from it and their basic mo model of what was going on. And they call the pre-Portage uh, Lake Volcanics Sinrift Volcanics here, and they call the Portage Lake Volcanics Post-Rift Volcanics in, this, in these two slides. But here is where they actually do a model similar to what I did. Uh, and they call it North America's Mid-Continental Rift Evolution. It's figure six in that uh, short paper. And the reason, this is what I used as my base. But what they did differently from what I did is I, I included the pre-rift rocks where they just have crust basement rocks labeled here. I showed you that they were Archean and Paleoproterozoic or Archean and Paleo and Proterozoic in age, and to give you a general outline of what was already existing in the ground when this rift started to form. They also added little volcanoes and stuff. And as you can see, they didn't include what I did, like when I included my core. Um, and they also have faulting along the uh, continental crust uh, lithospheric mantle boundary, which I left off. Um, but I left it off because I'm not quite convinced that that faulting is that horizontal. But like I said, this is still being uh, studied right now. So what did I mean by when I mentioned the core? Okay, so what you see here is um, what we call a uh, QAPF diagram. All right, and at the bottom, you can see where I pulled this from. Uh, you can see what that means. Um, but basically, what this is, is it is a diagram that has been done to show you, and I'm using the plutonic rocks one here. There is one for fine-grained uh, extrusive rocks as well. But the QAPF diagram here shows you what percentage of quartz alkali feldspar plagioclase and something called feldspazoids which is the bottom part of that triangle and how to classify rocks and this is good you can use this in the field it, you can usually in, in in plutonic rocks you can really pick this stuff out the part on the right is just a zoom in of that so you can read it a lot better and in this next slide i am going to get rid of things we're only going to be dealing with the upper part of the triangle which usually you will be dealing with. The Feldspathoid thing is kind of a special case, but they're rare up there, so you can just rely on the top part of, the, of, the, of this uh, triangle diagram. So I mentioned this core, what I think it is. And what I think that core was, was in that magma chamber, um, as it emptied and it was on its death throes, what would have been left behind in the approximate area at the bottom of the crust would be something very similar to um, the flood basalts. Or the, I didn't just say basalts because there's other rocks, but the uh, overlying volcanics, except this never made it to the surface. It would have had a longer time to crystallize. So what you would have ended up with is in that core, the outside parts near the continental crust would be slightly older as that magma residual magma chamber cooled towards the center, which is where you would have your younger rocks. And although chemically, they are probably very similar to basalts and andesites in that core, they are going to be coarser grain because they took longer to cool. So you'd probably, what you probably would find in there would be mostly gabbro and diorite. You might find some um, quartz gabbro and maybe some... Uh, Monzo diorites and stuff like that. That's why I have that red uh, highlighted area off to the right because that's where I believe those rocks would fall. If if you could drill down into that hypothetical core and actually sample it, and good luck uh, being able to drill 30 kilometers down. Uh, the deepest uh, core we got in the UP is what uh, 7,000 feet. Uh, so that's what a mile and a half. That's so that's what like three 
shy of just shy of three kilometers. So you have to go about 10 times deeper to sample this thing. But I just thought that the core should be mentioned because I would think it is a significant part of the rift development, forming that plug at the base of the crust that might be an explanation for some of those horizontal faults that they modeled in the previous slides. All right, now what I am going to do for you is I am just going to run through these slides at a little quicker pace for you so you can see from one slide to the next beginning with the pre-rift configuration all the way to um, present day here for you just so you can get a good look at it and now all I'm gonna do is show you the references uh, except for the QAPF diagram um, these are the other references I used, and the big one is this first one right here, which I actually took the excerpts from. And here are my other references. But anyway, that is it. I hope you learned something. If you have any questions about the Mid-Continental Rift, I will be happy to answer any of them because I spent a lot of time up there. It's where I own my cabin is on that Keweenaw Peninsula. Um, oh, uh, what I forgot to mention before, too, is in the slide that's up to present day, I did put little blue lines at the top where Lake Superior presently sits. They're greatly exaggerated. Um, the, I know they're kind of hard to see, but anyway, I forgot to mention that. But um, like I said, feel free to comment below, and I hope you learned something.